let me adjust one thing. While Ed's grabbing that one thing, I'm Jennifer Brown. And on behalf of the Center for Literary Arts at Frostburg State University, I'd like to welcome you to the 15th annual Western Maryland Independent Literature Festival this year online. Um, I'd especially like to, inter or to welcome you to this event with Ed Doyle Gillespie. Um, but before I talk about him, I'd like to thank our sponsors who make the work possible. Those sponsors include the Allegheny Arts Council, the City of Frostburg, Savage Mountain Punk Arts, and several offices at Frostburg State University, including the Office of the President, the Office of the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, and the Department of English and Foreign Languages and Literature. Edward Doyle Gillespie is a longtime Baltimore resident. He's a police detective. He holds a degree in history from George Washington University and an MLA from Johns Hopkins University. And since we met at a City Lit event a few years ago, he's been a great friend to the Center for Literary Arts, uh, holding or hosting really two sparkling uh, events last year, uh, just you know, showing off his brilliance. Um, and we're so grateful to have, to have had him with us last year online and to have him with us this year online. Uh, he'll talk about his work, uh, but I'm curious to see where his, uh, his forthcoming book of poems is. Um, and now if you will help me to welcome him uh, virtually, this is Edward Doyle Gillespie. Hello, thank you very much. Thank you. I am so excited to be here. I'm so excited to be that literature and uh, the arts are still nudging their way forward, even with all the vicissitudes of what we've been going through. So thank you so much for bringing me in. I'm really, really happy. Uh, I wanted to, to talk a bit about why poetry works for me in terms of recording and in terms of expressing my experiences as a law enforcement officer. Um, I know there's been a lot of talk about policing in the news over the past few years. And uh, it's, you know, it's got me to really go back and think a lot about the work that I've done and why I've expressed it this way and how this fits into larger narratives about policing. Um, so I, I went back to a lot of my work and started going through it. And uh, kind of reminded me of Barbara King Solver. I heard her in a speech once say how she went back, she had to do a talk on animal dreams and she went back and reread it and thought halfway through who wrote this? Um, but she said, every writer that you've been has a right to exist. And so I look back at some of my work um, kind of looking for, as, if, as if I were an outside observer and I don't know who this person is, but went back to say, okay, who is this person? who's writing this, what's taking place. And so we know that writing and policing do go together. We're used to hard boiled detective novels and we're used to police procedurals and we've read and heard and things seems like The Wire and The Corner and Homicide, you know, so we, we've got that, um, but why poetry? And so I had to ask, so who is this poet? Why is this police officer writing poetry? <laughs> so uh, I'm writing a science fiction novel and uh, I went to look at the term viscera I had to use the term viscera, and, you know, so internal organs, the main cavity of the body and, you know, excuse the pun, the heart of the matter, you know, and so that took me to visceral, right, and it hit me that, okay, so maybe part of why poetry speaks to law enforcement is it has that, that brevity and the economy of language allows me to be in touch with the visceral, with what's very direct and very existential in policing. Um, there's something cathartic about that because that's usually where an officer encounters those shocking things, those, those existential crisis moments um, and uh, those, raw, those raw moments. Um, I, also, I also thought that, okay, so when I look at having to channel that, having to deal with that, that free verse worked really well. I couldn't, it couldn't be something that was too structured, too trapped, because those moments were very chaotic, uh, that as a law enforcement officer, you try to lend order to moments like this and try to trap them, but often they're, they're very chaotic. And I realized that when I look back at some of this work, if you took out the enjambment, they often read like short stories. Um, so 
let me just start you with this one. This is something that was inspired by uh, something that happened on my first year on the job. Um, this is called Final Hodge. When the call to prayer goes out from the mosque on Islamic way, I am helping to load Tavon Fitzgerald into the back of Medic 4. He has only a small hole from the girl's kitchen knife over his heart, but his body will erupt with a raspberry tide when the residents down at Maryland General crack his chest to practice the alchemy of resurrection. They will fail, unable to make the quick out of the dead, and I will gather his clothes, baggy layers of ghetto soldier uniform heavy with blood, and document them on a police form 56. I will wrap the chain of his Zodiac medallion around his butane lighter and stuff them into the smallest of the evidence envelopes. I will shake the clots loose from his ragged sweatshirt as I give it to the next red plastic bag in the pile. I will change my gloves three times and wonder whether he was distracted at that last moment by the loudspeaker reminding him that God is great. Um, that uh, I was taken from an actual incident. And the thing that struck me most and where I talk about that kind of wrestling match between the free verse and this content, you know, this the, the, the structure of the verse and the content is um, there was so much chaos, the chaos of what had been visceral, his viscera coming forth. And I was literally covered in it, trying to organize and categorize and catalog and then track everything about this guy's life from the chaos of watching him die. Um, so that is something that's going on inside of a lot of police officers. I think constantly trying to make sense of, organize these chaotic moments and chaotic concepts. Um, you know, the idea that I was looking at very intimate things about this person's life that were now just coming free. And I was trying to organize them and make them something impersonal. And I was intruding. Um, so that has hung with me. And that, that piece, I think, really speaks to that question that I raised about it. So maybe it was that. That then takes me to the mechanics of poetry. Do the mechanics of poetry speak to policing? And, you know, poetry is very much about that, the immediacy of sound. Uh, in many cases, it's why this, why consonants and assonance works in poetry, in many cases, to say something about the content. And so I had to ask to look deeper and say, was there something about the, about plosive sounds, right? About plosive sounds and about consonants that spoke to what I was trying to say with policing, um, the mechanics of it. And so I hunted through my work again, kind of looking at myself as this this writer, this third person that I don't, you know, um, and uh, ask where the sounds came together. Because in many cases, I, I remember the, um, even like the term shell shock, when you hear it, it sounds like the weapons that are making the trauma, you know, and uh, it brought me to this one that I wrote. Um, once again, you know, there's the implied author a lot of these, I think I often created a police officer and said, and this is a situation like what I had seen as a way to, to filter it out. This is called First on the Scene. It is late in the shift and I am breathing you in. It has been six months since anyone has seen you, smelled your oxtails and rice, heard the muttered oaths as you paced the third floor hall in rubber flip-flops. It has taken six months from what we can tell <clears throat> for you to become a dark stain in your thin bare mattress, a pair of empty eye sockets, a cloud of scent. I am standing in your place because after six months, you have seeped below the door, filled the air of this tenement flat. And now after six months, you are a skeleton, a tent of skin, a jagged knife, a stolen check and I am breathing you in. So I have to wonder, does the hard Germanic 
K and X of six months, right? And skin, six months skin and knife. Do those sounds shock and compel the reader as they move through? And the skeleton act as a bridge between the stabbing consonants of those hard voice sounds and the smoother sibilance of some of the S sounds, the skeleton. Because there has to be something shocking in that moment, even though it was completely quiet. The violence was gone at that point and the body was taking its natural course. But the violence, the trauma that you know, the first responders are experiencing and that the neighbors experienced as the truth comes out is just as present and immediate as that stabbing that took place six months before. So there's the re-stabbing, there's the re-traumatizing, right? Then, then, so the question is, how do I translate that to the to the uh, to the, the readers? You know, um, that was. It also brought me to think that I wrote that in part because I had to keep in mind that when you get to a dead body, and police officers encounter this all the time, and you take that breath. And officers will tell you, every officer has encountered the decomposing body, sometimes that you can smell before you get to the house. But when you smell something, I've asked classes of mine, what are you actually doing when you smell something where you're taking in it its particulate matter? You're incorporating it into your body. They ask them, so think of all the people we've incorporated into ourselves as we've worked this job, right? That we've allowed to come in and haunt us biologically. Then so looking at that, continuing with that, there's that person, I never knew her, I couldn't, but that was our crossroads. And then, so that then speaks to the question of my next portion of this was the issue of persona. Um, when we meet people, when people become characters in our lives as law enforcement officers, often it's very for a very brief, intense moment. Something terrible has happened to them or we've taken control of a situation like a car stop and we're talking to them and we're telling them what needs to happen. And it could be a completely banal situation. It could be something lethal and horrifying and everything in between, but it's usually it's intense and it's short. And I thought that the um, economy of language when it comes to creating characters in poetry is often is something that lends itself to why I pick poetry for this. Um, this is called Suspended. Sus suspended. The guy is a prison Muslim, gray bearded and dying of prostate cancer. He drove up here from Virginia in the battered white Honda that a mosque brother gave him. And I pulled him over for the missing lights, the reek of gas and rubber, the jigsaw of glass that should, never, that should have been a, a rear window. His eyes are shuttered halfway as he calls me, Mr. Officer from behind the wheel and admits that he hasn't had a license in five years. This trip, he thought, would give him something to do while he, he waited. He's sorry about the car and the mess he's made. He doesn't want me to think the worst of him. We're given these moments to access our humanity and that of others. Now, this is my latest book. This is Gentrifying the, the Plague House. This is my latest book. This was This is my... This is my COVID book. So I, uh, <laughs> this was one that I pulled together and wrote. This was uh, during quarantine, which I, I, of course, I never actually quarantined because I was essential. So I was driving the lonesome highway by myself to get to work. But um, this is called Rapture of the Fish Man. The fish man kicked up his legs that morning. He slapped his hands on the concrete and he called out, chirping and gurgling with a voice that cracked glass, like cracked glass and dry splint, dry wooden splinters. The fish man tried to swim in midair that day, tried to swim on dry land, tried to swim through the congregation of jobless white t-shirts. He bashed his head down on the concrete of McMeckin Street and let his red flowers spread across the, the sidewalk. The fish man danced as though he'd been hauled out of the sea and onto the deck of a schooner, christened 
the street with the foam and the spit that welled out of him as he jammed a speedball into his, the big vein of his right leg. He christened the street with his blood and his spit until a blonde medic, close to the end of her shift, came with naloxone to stick up his nose and wash him free of his holy ghost. It's from the first time I saw someone who'd taken a speedball, which is a very strong stimulant like a cocaine and a very strong depressant like heroin done together. So I took a little foray into magical realism here with uh, one of the people that I, I, I encountered. I saw one of Rossetti's stunners on the bus. This is called Lilith in Transit. Excuse me, it's called Lilith in Transit. <laughs> I saw one of Rossetti's stunners on the bus this morning. I'm pretty sure it was Lilith, but don't hold me to that. I mean, she had those corn forth lips and she was brushing her hair, admiring her re reflection in the mullion's fractured steel, but I could be wrong. I folded my paper, slumped in my seat and watched my commuter Lilith preen her thick red curls as we shuddered past Holiday Street and the old boarded up porno shop. Over her shoulder, I could see the place where Clara used to dance on her pole, and I swear the blind man on the corner of President in Baltimore, doomsday soothsayer with his all-seeing eye dog, hailed her as, as we passed. But my Lilith, incendiary in her affliction t-shirt, two rows up, only twisted her hair in those tortoise shell coils, pursed her lips, and waited for the next stop to arrive. Always been struck by that piece. And I think anyone familiar with Baltimore knows you you never run out of characters with the block um, <laughs> downtown. And um, it occurred to me one day how how comfortable, how comfortable a suburban boy felt just kind of walking around there in my uniform and talking to people and how open they were about where their lives were, what was going on with them and what took place there. Um, and um, so this is... Uh, this is called Vixen in the Alley on New Year's Eve. To show me what she means, what I must understand, she rises up on one foot, stretches one thigh open away from its mate, stands Eke Homo in platform heels. She tells me again that she has named herself Vixen and that she is the only white girl at the Diamond Club who has no Baltimore stigmata on the hollows of her arms who does not have to have sleep shuddering her purple lids of her eyes. She is thick and she is healthy, she tells me again. She should be the one to dance for me because tonight is the first of the year and she can tell that I have chosen the wrong words for far too many times. I have accepted far too much smoke that has only strangled me. I have left far too much shredded green glass in my wake but none of this matters to Vixen in her platform shoes. She will forgive me my, my trespasses, she says, because this is the first of the year. The horseback cops are traversing in front of Eddie's like a fascist promenade, and she is the one meant to usher me inside. I, um, you run across a lot of the people that work down on the, on the, the block. There's this there's a, a feeling of you know look you know who you are and who i am and this is what i'm plying and this is you, you tell me who you need me to be and there's a certain honesty in our dishonesty and um i couldn't help but be moved by the stories of a lot of the women down there um like i said the honesty a lot of them have about who they are and how they got where they are and um the intimacy that they have with the officers in many cases that you feel a certain sense of, of protectiveness, actually, you know, as you know what they're, they're, they're going through. Let me see here. So this book on the later edition of Sancho, Sancho Panza was one of my first books. And I have another example of Persona from this one. And um, this is based on a street informant that I had, a young lady who um, wanted to work with our unit and help us out. This is called Jess. We are below the shattered row house, the creeping vine row house that keeps watch over North Avenue like an opiate mother. 
slowly nodding, arching slowly over a newly empty crib. We are below the shattered row home that is turning green with that ivy that urgently comes to live in the broken places, the pieces of North at or Penn North. And she is telling me that she can smell soul food from Mel's. She can smell lake trout and white bread that soaks up the grease from a block away. This is the same row house shadow just days ago in which she talked about the old guy who asked how much extra he had to pay to slap her how much extra he had to pay to slap a white girl with his thick crooked hand because he wanted to see a good bruise, like an open palm signature that would swallow her whole face. And the redness is less now and her hands are swollen now. She is asking me if I can smell the grease of the sizzling fish and if I can hear the boys calling out a block away and how long I think it will take for the verdant fingers to completely enshroud this empty weeping house. Um, you're always struck by how survivable humans are. And um, a person who worked in drug addiction therapy told me that she said, one of the problems with humans is they can survive too much. Uh, that um, we might be healthier if we would just die when certain horrible things happen, but we learn how to adapt to them. And talking to this young woman, how she just saw the beauty in so much it was around her. I'm so grateful for so many things that to me just seemed implausible um, is something that sticks with me. I wonder, I wonder where she is now. I always wonder at that. still on the block and still thinking, you know, you, you meet these people and for that moment, there's just such intensity about what they often, they want you to know. Like my, my driver, my, my Muslim driver who is dying of, of cancer, he wanted me to know certain really important things about him. So my first thought is what difference does it make if some cop, you know, see again, thinks you're a good guy, but it was like, officer, I want you to know. I'm, I'm not this bad guy. I did some bad things, but I, I really am a decent person. And then it, I realize it's not that shocking. I think we all kind of want that. I think we all want that, no matter what our interaction is. And so it's very easy. I think, I think using poetry is great because it does demand that you look at that person, look at that situation, and you look at it in a, in a reductionist way and say, this is a person, right? This person was speaking to me through the lingua franca of humanity, right? And I've got to whittle that down to a few lines, you know? And I could usually, you could usually use those lines to dehumanize someone, of course. But I think that for me as a tool, I had to say, who is this person? And it really made me to say, you know, why, why would this person say that? Why would this guy in this situation, instead of just saying, you know, man, I'm dying of cancer. I don't care if you give me a ticket, whatever. But it was like, no. And he told me to make sure I went to the doctor. He said, I tell the guys, make sure you go to the doctor because I didn't go. Uh, how are we doing on time? Good, okay, <laughs> all right. I've got uh, another one here from the block, actually. So you do bar checks. So you walk around and you have to walk into bars sometimes, see how, what's going on. Is anybody brawling, you know? Um, so, uh, this is called billiards. This is from a, a scene that I saw as I just walked into this one thing. And, I, and again, there's the implied author. I said, okay, so what else could I do with this story here? Billiards. It is past noon on a Tuesday and I find you shooting pool with the same old man as before. You have made a long rope out of your hair and you talk sweetly to him because he is the, he is the dust bowl man who walks the block. He is the bony, silent wisp of a Baltimore that knew milk wagons and colored only signs. The one whose narrow eyes and chapped mouth are always lost below the lip of a blue baseball cap. He is the one who talks to the black girls on, on their smoke breaks in the alley, telling them that he is such a dancer, such a lover, and is silent as you stretch yourself across the, the, the table to shatter a triangle of hard colored balls. The tight cotton of your t-shirt rides up your body like it did the, did the day before 
showing him the beads that you wear and the North African tan of your waist. You whisper along with the, the jukebox, bite your lower lip, squinting at the wedge of color on its green felt home. And before you break it, you arch your back and toss him the Rapunzel braid that is hung waiting on the other side of your face. Um, the young woman uh, that I met who was a bartender and there was a certain science she developed, a certain art and science as to how to talk to men, specifically men, and see things about them that she could pull out to compliment them, to make them feel like they were the only man there. She told me, I know how to make guys feel like they're the only man in the world and I'm there for them. And uh, there was just this scene of this beautiful young woman, very vital, very, you know, this arch archetypal, just, you know, new by a young woman talking to this very old weasoned man who looked like he was just on his last legs. And you could see an energy about him that, you know, seemed to make him feel that it was 50 years ago, you know. Um, but she said, that's what I do. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Very cool. Let me give you one more. So this is actually based around an officer that I knew um, who was really, he was kind of the warrior I always wanted to be. Um, you know, I, I tried to go to the U.S. Marines and I, I wanted to go to war. And, you know, I, so I ended up working with this officer and he, he gave me this image and I don't think he understood the gravity of it. Um, it's called hijab. The thing he remembered most about taking Kuwait City was how the women ran right up to the armored filth of their lumbering M1 Abrams tank. They ululated these women, a flapping sea of black shrouds and dark gleaming eyes, he, he, he recalled. He made the sound as best he could for me, and I imagined their high resonating voices entangled in the pain-based pain groan of American tanks and armored cars. Lost in the bleat of a swooping chopper, one came so close he remembered that he feared she would be caught in their slowly grinding treads. The woman looked at him, perched on his turret, his face covered against the sand's angry blast with a green marine-issued towel and plastic goggles. She stood on her toes and saw the surprise that sparked behind his dusty lenses when she took hold of her veil, pulled it down, and showed him her face. He, um, that image stuck with him and he gave that to me. It's, it's stuck with me ever since. This cop, by the way, is an expert in flowers and flower arrangements that, um, particularly roses. He said that he went to therapy and they said he had become so violent and so brutal because his life was completely masculinized and he had to find something feminine and creative to put him in a different space. So he arranges flowers. I think. So that's across work here from Masala Tea and Oranges. This is the a very avant-garde cover, but this is Masala Tea and Orange is one of my early books um, on the later edition of Sancho Panza. And then I read from my most recent collection, Gentrifying the, the, the Plague House, which is done through um, Apprentice House Press at Loyola here in Baltimore City. And thank you all so much. Thank you. This is, I am so excited to be part of a of a literary festival with everything that's going on. I'm so, this has been great. I can't wait to do it in person next time. <laughs> so, so Ed, I'm gonna just give you some uh, remarks out of the chat. Sure. Uh, and Sally Rosen, well, actually first, um, 
John Brayton writes, there's poetry in those streets. Uh, Cassie Conklin pulled out uh, the quote, uh, every writer you've been has the right to exist, which is such a beautiful line. Um, and Sally Rose and Kindred and I both apparently made a note of the, the combination between Alchemy of Resurrection and uh, Police Form Number 56, um, that, that um, the juxt juxtaposition of the mundane and that language is just, as Sally says, my goodness. Um, wow. you know, it's, it's really striking. Um, but John asked a question, does dehumanization become a cushion like scar tissue? Yes, um, yes, uh, absolutely. It's, I think lots of people don't realize that the repeated trauma that officers undergo on so many different levels. I mean, whether it's actually swap, I mean, I, I've watched someone die, like literally look me in the eye and die, you know, seeing child, uh, child abuse, even just human degradation. You start, yes, it's, it's scar tissue, it's armoring. Um, the only difference is you learn, you know, a scar is something that you survive and you move on, your body learns to work around it. Dehumanization, you start to damp down all of that trauma and anger and re that it becomes repressed and energy, it's an, it's an energy. So like with physics, it's got to come out somewhere. And this is where you see a lot of the dysfunctional behavior with, with law enforcement officers. And um, I, I've kind of, yes. So in, in, in short, yes, unfortunately, yes. John also asks, um, although I, I am inclined to make this remark that one of the things that strikes me about your work is the, the combination of how you deal with, with trauma with tenderness, right? Your poems are very tender and very, uh, like very of the, of the body tender, but also emotionally tender. Uh, and that just is a, is a thing that I find remarkable about your work. Mm -hmm. um, but so John also asks, uh, is it wise to hire people directly out of combat? Uh, should they be screened or treated for PTSD before putting them out on the street? Oh yeah, I think, I think that, I think we should do a lot more psychological vetting of all sorts with, 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 with law enforcement. Um, and, I, and I don't think that we should ever discount, you know, I mean, I think there are some people with great combat, you know, their combat experience, their military experience, educational experience, but everyone there, I think we should do, and I don't know, I don't know what they do. I mean, that's not my bailiwick, but um, sure. I think there was a, I believe a tradition with the Lakota Sioux that when you came back from war, you had to spend, I think like two weeks outside of the village before you could come back in. And there was a whole lot of rituals to reincorporate warriors back into society, um, knowing that they would have to go out and do it again and that they had to live amongst people too. So yeah, I, I think that's that's very re that's reasonable. I think we often forget, again, we, we do this in, in cycles. We did it with Vietnam and we've done it again, that we forget that war has left a terrible tra traumatic mark on this society and we have to deal with it on all sorts of levels. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Nina Forsyth asks, the first few poems reminded me somewhat of the World War I poets like Wilfred Owen. Oh, wow. uh, do, do those poems resonate with you? Oh my gosh. So we had to, re we had to read a poem in the first grade. Uh, we had to bring a poem in and read it. And my mother, <laughs> this is just done with your parents and find something. And my mother gave me dulce et decorum est pro patria more. I remember my father saying, oh, don't you think that's a little heavy for a seven-year-old kid? But, um, so I went in and, and read that and that Wilfred Owen has been with me ever since. Um, so yes, oh my gosh. And it's funny because I don't really consciously think, well, let me, you know, let me draw on this, but I, the war poets have been with me for so long. Yes. And I've revisited that genre with the most recent wars and found some, I mean, whether it's rap music, that they've put out, that soldiers have put together rap music, poems, short stories. So yes, that's that's very much a part of my of my thinking. So much so that it's not even conscious. But yeah, but th thank you for the, co the comparison. Um, I think it's coming from a lot of the same place. Yeah, definitely. When you you talked about the the kind of structure and how you break your lines and things like that, the I always think of the first four lines of that poem, uh, the structure of them, right, where the uh, the first two lines are consistently broken by commas, right? Uh, focusing on the struggle and the movement, like the halting of the movement. And then the next two lines, lines three and four, are uh, so much about the length that it takes for them to, to get to the point of rest, right? Till on the flaunting mm -hmm. 
right. draw on the haunting flares, we turned our backs. Turned our backs. Rest, began to, began to try. Right, yeah. that movement is so long, right? And and mm -hmm. that those four lines are a model, I think, to anyone who wants to think about how to to use the line to make their point. Um, it just stands out to me. That's, um, that is, yes. <laughs> oh, I love that poem. It's really, it's come back. I've actually used it in training. I've used it in training. I've, I train officers to use how to put on a gas mask properly. And uh, so they have to speak with the mask on. So I give them that poem to read. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Um, well, uh, and actually Mina's remark is, wow. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Ed, I've, I've put a remark in the chat to say that, um, that Main Street Books here in Frostburg should be able to, to help folk uh, with ordering copies of your books if they'd like to obtain copies. Um, but if there's, uh, you know, I'm sure people can also find you online for uh, for ordering of those of those books oh great yeah i'll um i'll i'll make sure you i'll send some in, I'll forward some information definitely perfect um and just one last comment maybe we'll end on this one um from or a question from sally rosen kindred your poems are, are so full of empathy using striking imagery to see others do you feel like figurative language and persona uh the transformations it provides helps enable that so do the personas enable the um, empathy? Oh, absolutely. I think, I think once again, you have to kind of distill, you say, okay, who is this? What am I trying to say here? So I think, yeah, when you, you really have to whittle the character down because I think a lot of police writing, a lot of writing about law enforcement and conflict and things, you can make the other very two dimensional. Um, but I've, I've found that if I really want to build a character that's of some value to the reader and some value to me as a writer, I have to really say, who is this as a person? Like what, what's going on here? What's driving this? You know, um, even when I, when I talk about, when I teach ethics, I use, I use um, comic book characters in some cases. And I say, you know, well, why did this villain do what this villain did? Was this villain just a two dimensional? And we talk and we use Marvel comics a lot because my, 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 my recruits like it. And so you're able to say, okay, this is a person who's motivated by things, who's motivated by something that you can identify as possibly being a real motivator. Or you could say, well, what, if, what would I do in that situation? I think that dehumanization we talked about earlier, many police officers go through that by simply saying, I would never do what this person did. I could never live like this person. I would never be like this person. And that part of that is to say, it scares me when I see this person knowing I could be this person. I could be in this person's situation. I could be homeless. I could be mentally ill. I could be committing petty crimes because of drug addiction, uh, you know? So yes, in short, yes. Um, using figurative language, figuring out how to paint this person humanizes them, rehumanizes them. Well, on that note, uh, and thank you for such gorgeous language and beautiful poems and, uh, and deep, uh, deep humanity and empathy. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm excited. I would love to do this year in and year out. <laughs> That's great, thanks. Thank you.